ena mana, ena reo, ena karangatanga maha, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, ena tini mate, nā reira haere ena mate, haere, haere, haere. Ki te hunga ora, ki a tātou, uh, ke te hui, i tēnā rā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Ka mihi hoki, ki te hau kainga, ki te ateawa, me uh, Ngāti Toa. Ka nui te koa, me te hare, ki te hare mai ki Wanganui i a koutou. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou ka toa. Well, thank you, uh, Lester, and um, uh, thank you also uh, to uh, Te Reo Ariari, to Judith and Celia um, for your comments. And good afternoon all. I've really been looking forward to, uh, to this conference, um, and I thank you for being here. I hope you've had a good break. I uh, didn't think about work for a while. Um, I uh, forgot about the national standards for a few days there, so that was good. Um, it's great to have all the international people here as well. Uh, it's an overused phrase, perhaps, that the idea of that um, something or, or people are world class, but that really is uh, the kind of people that we've got here uh, um, from overseas. But more importantly, in some ways, to me, so fantastic academics, but more importantly, in some ways, to me, they're public intellectuals who are engaged in struggles in their own uh, local uh, areas, whether it be in New York State, uh, David Hirsch, or um, or in London with uh, Meg Maguire. So I hope you will um, please talk to them, make the most of them uh, being here amongst us. Also like to acknowledge my colleague from Waikato, uh, Maggie Hohepa, and again thank Frances Nelson um, for her uh, foresight in, in, in helping with the, getting the Rains project off the ground, and also Sandy Aitken who has been my contact with NZDI now for the last um, three, four years um, around this project and leading up to this conference and has done a lot of the, uh, the organisation. I'd also like to mention Anne Easter and Michelle White who are here and they worked with me on the RAINS project and it's a particular pleasure to have my um, partner Marika Kaashagen uh, here too. Marika is a primary teacher and I have to admit um, that she has provided a lot of wise counsel around the RAINS research so I'd be sort of fretting, I'd be saying, you know, I haven't heard um, back from those teachers yet, and I left a message a year, uh, sorry, a year ago, a week ago. <laughs> and Marika would say, just wait a bit, you're not top of their list, you know. <laughs> and of course she was right, and I had to learn to be patient, and uh, we would make contact. Okay. Well, today we're um, taking stock of the state of New Zealand primary education and it's my job to provide a view based on my research in the RAIN schools over the last three years. So not just about national standards, but I'll certainly be touching on national standards along the way. It's no uh, small ask, even with the extended time. Thank you, uh, uh, Lester. Um, and I'll be making really a series of observations. Uh, there are six RAIN schools, so let's just remind ourselves of them. Uh, first of all, we have a, a largely middle-class uh, suburban uh, school with a, a mainly Pākehā and, and Asian um, intake, uh, that's Seagull School. We have Kānuka, which is a, um, a large, uh, lower socioeconomic school with about 70% Māori uh, children, and uh, it has uh, both uh, Rūmaki classes, total immersion classes, and bilingual classes. There's a small rural school called Juniper, and um, it's a, uh, about an hour from uh, the nearest city, um, and uh, a, a small school, small rural school. Uh, Cicada is a, um, a much larger school, another low socioeconomic school, and uh, with a, a more mixed uh, kind of intake, um, about 20% Māori, 40% Pacifica, and 30% Asian. Uh, Magenta is a, a high socioeconomic uh, school and um, has a, a, a largely uh, European or Pākehā intake, and more of a commuting school, if you like, to the, to the uh, nearest city, um, people with lifestyle blocks, as well as some people that have, um, that have farms in the area or work on farms. And Huia Intermediate, which is a large um, uh, mid, 
socioeconomic uh, suburban intermediate. Well, actually very diverse in many ways, about 40 per cent uh, Pākehā and otherwise extremely diverse. I think uh, something like close to 50 different ethnicities. So only six uh, uh, schools, but they're diverse schools, and the study ha does have a lot of depth. The mainstay of it is, is interviews. Uh, there are, in fact, um, 486 interviews. Some of those are repeat uh, interviews, which gives us more depth over time. Um, and there were school leaders, uh, teachers, parents, children, and reviewers. So we're sort of seeing the schools from all sides, if you like. There's also classroom observation, there's documents, there's the websites, all of those sorts of things. And if we think of the RAINS project a bit like a house, if you think of the, the uh, report so far, we've had a glimpse in through the front door, and, uh, uh, but we've yet to go into the rooms and really have a good look around. And to some extent, that's what's happening now as I write up um, case studies on each of the schools, and uh, we'll get more depth and kind of more flavour as, as time goes on. So I'm continuing to work on this project. Now, one reason I'm keen to tell as much of the story of the RAIN schools uh, as I can is that I see as a counter to the problem uh, an increasing range of people are commenting publicly on New Zealand schools, and that many of them, whether politicians, newspaper editors, or others are a long way from a realistic view of schools and perhaps don't want to be more realistic in case it gets in the way of what they want to argue. Um, I know that David Berliner is going to talk about this to some extent in his presentation uh, tomorrow, but I'd like to give us a few uh, recent New Zealand examples. So this was interesting, a press release on Scoop from just about a week ago, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I'm reading off uh, her website that Anna is the, is the founder of the Anna Stratton, uh, Stratton fashion label and a wildly successful New Zealand entrepreneur, author and speaker. With an online following of over 60,000, over 30 retail stores, three books and a strong business leadership program under her belt, she frequently appears in the media and on stage discussing all sorts of things and, and education is now, now one of those. And uh, so many of us will, will know her label and, and know of her and her, and her uh, philanthropic work too, I should add. And she says, are we teaching our children to underperform by avoiding standards and failing to regularly set new expectations for our children to strive towards? We have, it seems, chosen to raise a generation of children that expect hand-holding and fair play in a world that simply isn't like that. And she also says, I can't help but wonder if our decline can be attributed to our preoccupation with fairness, individuality and readiness. Isn't it interesting to note, she says, that the countries whose rankings improved on the PISA test come mainly from the developing countries of Asia. Now, I don't really mind her musing uh, in this way, but then she tells us what the answers are, and they're in these bullet points here. Um, and I think the problem I have with this kind of advice that you could fit on the back of a business card is that it doesn't get us very far. The devil is in the detail of what these would actually mean in an educational context. Here's another example. This is a website that's uh, started up um, and uh, you, it's, provides rankings of secondary schools in Auckland, and it's, there's going to be one in Wellington too, apparently soon, and I would think that there'll be one around the national standards, so we might as well uh, see what, what is, is going on here. Um, it's all about raw results, and the language is interesting. Here at Witch School in Auckland, we cut out the eerie fairy stuff, which surrounds popular talk about secondary school performance. Instead, we focus on the heart of performance results. An Olympic Athletes' performance is no good if they don't bring home the medals. A boy band's performance is no good if they don't hit number one on the charts. A school's performance is no good if they don't produce the results. Now the problem is, of course, that it's very unfair to just be using raw test scores and providing no context. Were it so easy to make judgments about uh, school performance, lots of researchers would have a much easier life, I can tell you. But the problem is that anyone can do this. You know, we can set up a blog, um, get the data, it's freely available, and put it on a website. Here's a government one, and, and one somewhat closer to the national standards. After the release of the re regional um, uh, data, 
on 18 July last year, several national MPs put out this media release, and uh, obviously their names went in the uh, and figures as, as um, uh, fitted with their electorate. So insert the MP's name, welcomes uh, regional uh, information on education results. They all went on to use exactly the same could do better wording. I'm happy to see, insert the, the uh, percentage figure, of students in the region achieve the national standard in reading. While these are great results, we want to see our primary students do even better and this data will help schools to focus resources to better support kids. Now, clearly this template release was the national government's PR machine in action because so many MPs put this out. Um, but you know, how do these politicians know what is reasonable to expect uh, from their local school? Um, what if something was in the water that year? Uh, really, this expectation of continuous improvement is rubbish. It's not going to happen that things just keep on improving year after year after year. Some years will go back. And what is more disturbing about it is that it signals the start of a target-setting regime based on the national standards in which schools and teachers can always be expected to do better, regardless of how realistic that is and how well they are already doing. Now, if we, uh, there are plenty more examples that we could um, uh, look to, but a few things to note about all of this. First of all, that PISA is having a bigger influence than it used to, both because we're doing comparatively worse in it and because our government is, is more concerned with big data than previously, uh, the public information, uh, achievement information pipeline. And I expect we will hear a lot more about PISA in Bob's paper. Secondly, schools and teachers are becoming seen as more of a problem. New Zealand has largely avoided the scapegoating of teachers for economic and social ills seen elsewhere like uh, the UK, but subtle and more direct attacks on teachers are growing here. And there are wider groups involved, um, and of course there's the role of the internet and blogs and so on. It seems at times that every man, woman and their dog feels able to say what's wrong with schools and, and teachers. And I think these attacks on schools uh, and, and teachers are sanctioned by government, formally and informally. You know, what are the charter schools and national standards policies if not an implicit criticism of regular public schools and how they operate? The slogans of this government also carry implicit criticisms of teachers' efforts. The call for raising achievement for five out of five children as if the one in five, actually more like 16%, leaving secondary school without significant NCEA uh, qualifications were just a matter of teachers pulling their socks up. Or anticipation of acceleration, as if children can routinely shift from achieving below or well below the national standard to at or above standard within a year. As well, the government doesn't seem, see the need to consult effectively, um, and until recently anyway, has had little positive to say about teachers in schools. Now we have these festivals of education and the International uh, Summit of the Teaching Profession coming up in March, but it will be interesting to see how much um, of uh, regular teachers in schools, how much celebration of regular teachers in schools there will be in those events. Government also sets the tone for a political climate in which influential business people and media commentators feel able to simply ignore alternative perspectives coming from the sector or those who want to support it. I spoke at a public forum at Parliament before Christmas and suggested that our government was acting more like a blogger or a lobby group in education than what you would expect from a responsible government. I have to say that no one disagreed with that proposition. Now I'd point out too that all the criticisms I've talked about have been enabled uh, by the increasing availability of decontextualised achievement data, the national standards um, the raw NCA results and, um, and IB and so on, and I'd describe PISA as decontextualised too. Certainly it doesn't take account of differences in young people's lives uh, between here and Shanghai, for example. Well, I think that the, um, the uh, RAIN schools can give us a much more realistic account. So um, what do they indicate is going on in our, uh, our sector? To answer this question, I think we need to uh, look at the differences between the schools, as well as what they have in common. 
because one of the biggest failings of commentators on education is to recognise the complexities caused by context. So much in education depends. It depends on the group you're working with, the history of how things get done around here, the resources you have, even the time of day. Now, in case there's a slip of the tongue, I want to make it clear that I'm uh, pretty careful about criticising the Reins teachers in schools. I would if I felt it was needed, but for several reasons I think we need to be cautious. First of all, I think there's a lot to admire about the Reins schools. I made that very clear in the final Reins report, and we'll see it here too. Secondly, I don't uh, want to bolster the growing chorus of attacks on schools that I've just been talking about. Thirdly, I recognise that what often makes a school bad, if you like, is also what makes it good. And uh, Meg McGuire and I have worked with a colleague, Stephen Ball, who wrote a paper called Good School, Bad School, Paradox and Contradiction. And that's pretty much how I see it as, as well, that schools can be, uh, can be both things at, at the same time, depending on how you see them uh, and um, uh, the different uh, pe people and, and issues involved. And lastly, such criticisms would be misdirected. For instance, if I would like uh, teachers to be more critically reflective, then I need to consider teacher education and professional development, as well as the range, range of pressures on teachers, including policy pressures, time pressures, and pressures from uh, parents and communities. Okay, so starting then with the differences between the schools, the... Um, uh, as you can see, a whole lot listed here in terms of context, not just socioeconomic context, all sorts of things, and they have far-reaching effects. And then trajectories are really context as well, if you like. They're the local historical uh, context. If you came into the school as a teacher or a new principal, it's the way things have been done here. It sits there as something you can't easily change. We like to use the, uh, the notion of... Um, of trajectory to reflect the importance of past practice and incrementalism as well, that generally schools don't change very quickly, they evolve, and there are all sorts of good reasons for that. Now historically, New Zealand primary and intermediate schools have had a lot of freedom to take different trajectories and enact policy in, in different ways, and that's partly why we're seeing uh, such variation around the national standards. When we talk about agency, we're talking about the ability of individuals and groups to act on the world to make different decisions, to have different practices, um, and also responding to the, those trajectories in those contexts. So if we think about the impact of these local contexts, trajectories, and agency on the RAIN schools, they're very far-reaching in both expected and unexpected ways. So it's... it's oops, I'm just going to hit one here. Well, it's, um, it's expected, I guess, for instance, that Seagull School... Um, serving a suburban middle class and aspirant uh, community was a sought after school to work in and therefore had st stable staffing and well established and highly regarded school processes. It was not expected that Juniper, a tiny uh, four teacher school, would be just as highly organised, if not more so. But when we got up close, we found some wonderful staff, but also that for several years the board had been buying out the principal so that she didn't need to teach. Extraordinary what you can achieve in a school when you're a full-time principal with uh, only three other teachers and, and uh, 50 children to look after. A situation which, sadly for the school and community, wasn't sustainable. Expected, I guess, that Kanuka and, and Cicada would be particularly concerned about the achievement of children from disadvantaged backgrounds that dominated uh, their schools, but unexpected that one would jump towards the national standards and one would strongly oppose them. So what was going on there? Uh, I think context, trajectory and agency were all at work at explaining this difference. Kanuka had a, a new leadership uh, sweeping clean after, shall we say, a popular but fairly relaxed uh, previous principle. It had a mainly Māori intake and was caught in the politics of anti-deficit thinking as championed by my colleagues on the uh, Te Kotahitanga project, for example. So the senior leadership team there didn't want to talk about poverty. They talked about financial stress. And they made some uh, very assertive comments about how it was teachers who had to make the difference and work on the acceleration of children. Cicada had a more Pacifica and uh, Indian, I guess Fijian Indian intake. Um, the school was well resourced because the previous principal had been something of a hoarder. 
And the present principal, who had come out of leading a middle class school, was very articulate that this school was certainly dealing with the effects of poverty. On first impressions, Magenta was a comfortable middle class school in a a dark rural setting. It was, but it was also sitting on a very difficult demographic situation. The problem was that it was not so much general rural depopulation caused by mechanisation as at Juniper, uh, but uh, Magenta was dealing with middle class lifestyle block owners, many of whom with the downturn of the last few years uh, had started to struggle with costs and inconvenience of of living the rural dream and started moving back to town. There were others who were commuting um, or owning uh, farms locally that were still doing well financially. But they could afford to send their children to, to private schools and quickly would if they had any concerns about uh, their local public school. So unexpectedly, Magenta was the most genuinely concerned of all the RAIN schools about its reputation, national standards results, and so on. And finally, what about Puyo Intermediate? There we might expect staff to be less cohesive taking up a wider range of positions around the enactment of policy because intermediates uh, you know, have so many specialist staff in the arts, uh, technology and so on. A bit more like a secondary school, and indeed that was the case. We might also expect that dealing both with an older age group and a very diverse um, intake, that the school would have some social and behavioural issues that, seemed, uh, that um, other schools weren't so troubled with and again, this seemed to be true of Huia. So for instance, I helped out in a class making ice cream there one day. You know, it was uh, just the teacher aide and I, um, and you put the milk and the sugar and some flavouring in one bag, and you put the ice and the salt in another bag, and you put them together and jiggle them around, and you make ice cream, and hopefully the kids don't get the salt in with the, um, with the ice cream, otherwise it, you know, it doesn't taste very good. But um, the reason that I had to step in and help was that the regular teacher was dealing with a group of boys that had started their day by smoking marijuana behind one of the classrooms. Now, which is a reality for our society. Uh, Q, um, the nine-year-old, found drunk in one of our um, skate parks in Hamilton over the the summer. But it's a reality that a lot of primary schools would also still be quite surprised to have to deal with. Not at Huia, though, where they were telling me they were seeing more and more issues that would have once been confined to secondary schools. What was unexpected at Huia, and comes back to the agency of the senior leadership team, I think, was their enthusiasm for telling this story about national standards achievement in the school, warts and all. Uh, There was certainly no gilding the lily there. But by painting a harsher picture of low performance than they really needed to, they made themselves vulnerable to intervention, and uh, Aero did intervene. Um, and perhaps it sort of had to as well, because where a school has data that indicates lots of children achieving poorly, Aero may have relatively little choice but to come down heavily. In the absence of any value-added approach being taken by government, the logic of the data says there's a problem to be fixed. So I think it, in some ways it was naive to think the Ministry and Aero wouldn't pick up on the, on the high proportion of children positioned as below and well below there, but I think it comes back to the depoliticised stance of many teachers and schools that I'll come uh, back to shortly. So overall, these are the kinds of differences between schools uh, that that I saw with the RAIN schools. And when I go into a new school, my senses are kind of on high alert. Um, And I've learnt, really, to look out for both the unexpected as well as the expected. So if I was going to characterise our schools, I would say that in the first instance, they are diverse, but not just in the most obvious ways. And you really do need to get to know each school to make sense of what's really going on there. Okay, now I want to look at some similarities between the schools. And the first thing, I think, um, is that they were all essentially sound. They, were, they had uh, generally happy kids and parents, lots of good teaching, and a, a, a genuinely caring attitude to children. All the adults uh, were putting their best foot forward and wanting the best for the kids. Now, That may sound a bit Pollyanna-ish, but it's basically how I see it. When you get close up to the schools and talk in depth and see the well-meaningness and the effort being put in, it's hard to be too sceptical. I'm going to uh, quote Calvin Smythe here. Yes, a very uh, polarising blog, but sometimes he gets it uh, pretty much right. He says, The challenge of primary teachers to the cynical is that primary teachers are so idealistic, 
so unworldly, so well-meaning, so hard-working, and so successful that they mount a challenge to that cynical attitude and also to the idea that a group employed by the state can be any of these. <laughs> Let's take a look at uh, the school I was just talking about with the ice cream and so on, which would be the one I think the government would see as the worst of the, of the schools. Uh, it was found wanting by Eero and uh, has a one to two year return subject to uh, monitoring and, and intervention. Uh, when I interviewed the uh, research team, they actually had a lot of good things to say. Oh, that's the slide I was looking for, never mind. They had a lot of things to, uh, good things to say about the school. We tried very much to recognise that there were some things about that school that are very special. And I think it's important to recognise that because no school is actually uh, really a bad school. So this is the uh, review team leader for, for that school. And as did parents when we interviewed them at the end of 2012. Here's a few quotes uh, from parents. I'm not going to read them all. But basically, uh, the overall message is a, is a very positive one. Um, and we've got 13 uh, transcripts uh, and, and diverse groups, including um, people that are talking about the senior management team, and, to, and including people, for example, like that um, had uh, uh, children in the school that had been... Um, They'd been uh, refugees, uh, come to the school from, um, from places like the, uh, the Congo, and um, really just thought this was a, a most marvellous kind of school in terms of moving their children forward. So again, it's that kind of question of, um, of uh, uh, in what sense is, is this a good school or bad school? And then I asked the children, um, is there anything you would like to change about school? Of 19 children, 12 said there was nothing they would like to change, and only one said something that could indicate uh, any concern, her teacher not listening to her, and that actually related back to an incident uh, the day before, a frustrating incident. Now, I've laboured this point, I guess, because I think it's important that we develop and promulgate the mindset that even a school found to be uh, failing by Eero or in the court of public opinion may still be uh, really good in quite fundamental ways, and we need to be slow to judge. So, good school, bad school, uh, paradox and contradiction. Another similarity uh, had to do with ability grouping and uh, differentiation, and I'm also going to get on here to, um, to, if you like, data walls, comparative displays of achievement. When I think about the range classrooms I observed, and I personally spent a full day um, in uh, each of 27 classrooms across the uh, six schools, and Michelle and Anne also uh, were in classes some of the time, it felt like the kids were, were working in groups at least half of the time. Reading groups, maths groups, writing groups, and groups for other activities as well. Usually in-class grouping, um, some kind of rotation, some group with, uh, a group with a teacher, maybe a teacher aide, some working independently, perhaps on laptops or off to the library, or, or playing a learning game. And sometimes uh, cross-class grouping as well. Now, a point I'd like to make about a lot of this group work is that the organisation of it was really, really impressive. It would be good to take a cameraman in and do a documentary to show the public what actually goes on in primary schools these days. Because, you know, the ability of teachers to have a whole lot of kids making progress at different levels is a complex role that I just don't think is recognised enough. It's not just about having eyes in the back of your head, but employing various strategies to get the uh, groups working well and involves being very well prepared too. So this uh, photo is of the reading rotation for a large um, senior class at, uh, at Cicada that had about 50 children. There were two teachers, there was a uh, teacher aide, there were children with special needs coming and going, um, there were uh, uh, the children of uh, recent refugees, there were eight reading groups going on here and going through a tumble or, or rotation of three activities, um, 15 minutes each, um, but in other times we uh, saw much longer um, group periods. The groups are named after Roald Dahl books, so you probably can't see it, but we have The Enormous Crocodile, we have uh, George, as in George's Marvellous Medicine, we've got Fantastic Mr Fox, The Witches, Matilda, Willy Wonka, The Big Friendly Giant, and my personal favourite, but hopefully not the lowest ability group, the twits. <laughs> and of course, 
There are many other kinds of differentiation going on within primary schools. Kids are being pulled out of class for help as individuals or in small groups and participating in particular programs and interventions to improve their progress or extend them, and some of the schools had gate classes or gate clusters as well. Now, much of all of this grouping and differentiation is very positive, I think, but I do worry about the social and educational costs for those in lower groups if teachers are not approaching it critically enough. I don't think we have enough discussion of the downsides of ability grouping in this country. Also, whereas internationally there have been lively debates about the effects of streaming or setting or tracking, there hasn't been much New Zealand research on it for a long time, apart from a 2011 paper by Gary Hornby at the University of Canterbury and colleagues who raised concerns about the effects of between-class ability grouping or streaming in nine Christchurch intermediate schools. This raised a few heckles in the gifted uh, ed area, and Louise Tapper, also from the University of, of Canterbury, uh, responded like this. She says, Complaints from opponents that top stream classes get the best teachers, that there's no opportunity for, for fluidity between stream classes and schools, uh, that selection processes into stream classes are often flawed and can be bi biased against some minority cultural groups are all valid. However, I contend that solutions to these issues are quite straightforward with the right approach. Now, I don't think it is uh, straightforward. Um, I think it's all very well for, for the, the kids in the top uh, streams and gate clusters or, or, or classes, uh, but it needs great care and, and caution. And you'll see from the quotes that start circulating um, between the um, keynotes that the children are very aware of the status hierarchies of the groups and all too ready to position themselves and their peers. So this is one uh, girl at, uh, at Seagull School, for example, and the interviewer is asking about um, uh, the, the maths groups, circles, triangles and squares, and uh, getting towards the bottom, uh, we find that the squares just do what they're told to, and sometimes they go on the mat. So, you know, it's kind of very much positioned uh, which group that is, I guess. I think that national standards often just provides another opportunity for this uh, labelling and positioning uh, with data walls. These are um, photos taken in a year three and four class. They, um, they have uh, um, the children's names on cars and they're driving up a road uh, past the math stages and the little white um, arrows uh, reflect the, um, the uh, national standards, if you like, for each um, uh, year group. And just to, so that you understand how it works, and uh, it goes right back to stage three, and the um, arrows go right back as well. And also um, in this uh, class, same sort of thing is being done with reading levels. Um, uh, the um, the uh, children are moving up on um, uh, um, balloons. And um, the writers, uh, same sort of thing within level one, two, and three, and so on, and uh, the children's names are on the pencils. Okay? Now, there will be a range of uh, views, I'm sure, on, around the tables about this sort of thing. But I want to just uh, say that uh, um, if I told you about the teacher, I had a lot of time for her. She had been 15 years in a, in, uh, at Kanuka, a, a low socioeconomic school, and was extremely hard working. Um, she talks here about never having winged a day in years and planning all her lessons, uh, but also being flexible enough uh, that she's not planning ahead uh, too much um, in, in the sense of being able to um, modify her classes. She obviously loved the kids and was very uh, committed to the school. And she just thinks it's motivating to, um, to position the kids like this. So I'm quite a visual person. I find that children engage in personalised things and, you know, it's just coming up with some gimmicky things, but it makes them want to look at it and be excited about, oh, my car's moving. It's moved from stage four to stage five. And it's a celebration that they've moved on in their learning. Well, so it's uh, quite motivating. I was talking to a boy the other day and saying, um, you know, at the moment you're at level one, you're an at level one writer. By the end of the year, I want to see you at towards level two. Well, his head went right up and he looked up at that writing display, so immediately he looked at that, he knew what the display was and where his name was and where he needed to get to. Now the kids, when we interviewed them, uh, we've got a few uh, discussions of this, and they're quite matter of fact. 
Um, but it would be fair to say that some parents um, at the school probably wouldn't have been happy with it going on just by um, virtue of some of their comments about reports and so on. For example, this is a parent who uh, has um, said that they don't uh, share the, the report with their child and, and the quote there. For our boy in particular, who's a child who sat uh, below, we haven't actually shared those with him because the reports, this is, because that would actually stunt him. He would read that and say, yep, I am stupid. That's what the other kids told me. And that would stunt his progress. We just share the positives in the report. Now, um, the way I read the situation, we have a very good committed teacher who is perhaps just not giving enough thought to the potential downsides of what, what she is doing in terms of, of uh, those displays. And in a sense, why should she, given the limitations of policy and of professional development um, in this country? And I have to say there were other variants, including some that positioned uh, children even more than those. Um, and um, also, I guess we can go back to those grouping practices and what does it say to uh, children having gate uh, classes and so on. So I think what we need really is a major discussion about uh, the, the, um, the positives and negatives of all this kind of thing. Some more similarities. There was a big focus on numeracy and literacy in all the schools. Uh, um, quite a direct focus in the mornings, and then uh, the topic or big idea or whatever often relegated to the afternoon. It's not surprising as the taught curriculum in New Zealand primary schools shifted towards a more explicit emphasis on literacy and numeracy teaching and assessment under the Clark government, and in fact the trend started under national governments of the 1990s. Even the 2007 New Zealand curriculum, uh, despite in many ways continuing the tradition of a broad curriculum, points to a focus on literacy and numeracy. But we've also got various kinds of uh, narrowing associated with the national standards, and you can read about those in the, in the final range report. But basically it's towards reading and writing and maths, despite often wanting to still offer a broad primary curriculum. The growth of assessment activities in those areas in order to support um, OTJs against the national standards, and a narrowing of focus in what was being taught within reading, writing and maths, again according to what was seen as important for the national standards. And at the same time, there are also differences along socioeconomic lines so that you have a two-tier curriculum being reinforced by the national standards policy. Uh, and even more intensive uh, focus on reading, writing and maths in low socioeconomic schools compared to a broader, more creative curriculum in the middle class schools. Another thing I think to say about the, the schools that was a similarity that was that they were all making a good effort in relation to things Māori. Some Māori commentators, um, John Tamahiri and, and Tūrua Flavel would be, would be examples, have attributed underachievement amongst Māori children and young people very directly to deficit thinking on the part of mainstream schools and teachers. And in his submission to Parliament in support of the partnership school legislation last year, Iwi um, Education Authority Chairman Toby Curtis, now Sir Toby Curtis, noted the the uh, consistently poor status uh, quo results for Māori, with no respite in sight from an unresponsive and unempathetic mainstream system. Well, I have to say that when I look at the RAIN schools, that these kinds of claims seem a little over-egged. I felt that all the schools were doing about as well as could be expected, given the staffing and other resources they had and the communities that they were working with. Certainly, it would be hard to criticise Kanuka with uh, its bilingual and rumaki programs, and it's a school within the regular state system. But even Seagull, a mainly Pākehā middle-class school, was making a huge effort with things Māori. And I think it's too cynical to see it as just a token effort. Um, and once again, we're in danger of, of killing the golden goose when we criticise schools too easily on the grounds of being monocultural. I'm not saying that there aren't all sorts of uh, problems. What I'm saying is... is um, that we need to remember to acknowledge the efforts that are being made. Another point is um, around uh, collegiality and the interdependence in these schools. Uh, if you take a rural school, a handful of staff, miles from anywhere, um, in charge of 50 or 100 children. You sit in the staff room, there are just a small number of adults. You know them very well and you rely on them because it's all hands to the deck. Someone has to go home sick, a reliever hasn't been arranged, you take two classes in the hall. Um, when a, 
A junior parent couldn't get her car started after dropping her child off. It wasn't the AA that got called. It was the husband of, of one of the teachers came down the road on his tractor and sorted the problem out. Um, now, in larger city schools, that interdependence was more within teams or syndicates, but it's still really important and it's highly prized. On the other hand, people are human as well. Small resentments are very important. Um, in a primary school where many people work year after year without, many without much real change in the power relations around their position. So, for instance, if the previous teacher has put you in a bad spot in relation to the national standards, you feel it. And performance pay, regarded in any sense as being unfair, will be horrendous in terms of the collaborative culture of our schools. The last similarity I want to point to is an aversion uh, to a political um, focus in the schools. Contrary to the impression that you, um, you might get from government or, or right-wing bloggers, most primary teachers and even many primary principals or, or senior leadership team members are not very political. Only a handful of the 159 teachers and 49 senior leadership team members we interviewed had uh, been active in, um, in teacher politics, for instance. Uh, present company being perhaps more the exception than the rule. Hard to know. Hard to know. Be, it will be interesting to see the discussion around the tables. So what are the issues? It's not just that primary teaching is gendered and, and a lot of women have in time out to have, uh, have families, but it's also a caring role that people go into uh, uh, often for often highly altruistic reasons around helping children um, as individuals and groups. It goes back to what Calvin was saying, I think. And this came through strongly in the interviews when we talked to teachers about uh, their motivations. And when I met uh, Marika about five years ago, she was a new entrance teacher, and I was spilling on about how we needed to uh, change this policy or that policy, all big picture stuff, of course. And uh, Marika, who, was, a, who, who uh, was in a school at that stage with the, with the new entrance, as I say, said, well, I'll know I've made a, a difference when, and she just listed off a whole lot of individual children and their learning needs and their social needs. And I thought, well, you really can't argue with that. But um, this altruism is very important, I think. Uh, Terry Locke and his and colleagues have suggested, on the basis of their research, that New Zealand uh, primary teachers are often likely to accept extrinsic forms of accountability if they are consonant with a discourse of intrinsic or professional accountability. And that's, this is what uh, they say. They say, if the good of the child is the undisputed end of teaching, a teacher who is convinced that the authoritative other the state, the subject advisor, the university scholar, the local community knows best how to define this good, is more likely to sacrifice autonomy out of deference to the expertise of the other and that other's uh, judgment. Another factor is it's just a very busy public kind of role. During the day there's only short breaks, you know, go to the loo, cup of tea, quick chat, evenings and weekends, lots of marking or other work. And also, uh, most teachers, I think, are used to a little privacy in the workplace. I was struck by how, by how often our interviews were interrupted by staff looking for a spare room to hear a child read or, or something like that. And very pragmatic, I guess, a lot of uh, the approach to teaching. Importantly, too, all the schools are responding to increasingly conservative political and social environments. Policy is all about achievement and literacy and numeracy. Boards are hearing and taking up this message that that is what their job is about as well. Parents are being encouraged to act as consumers and to be more anxious about uh, the background, uh, sorry, about their children's future prospects. So we have to be realistic about the background against which we are asking people in, in uh, schools to resist policy. Individual schools are quite vulnerable, and when I look at the RAIN schools, I can see how the local environment has allowed some to put their heads above the parapet and others not at all. There's also a lack of good critical PD and opportunities for renewal. And it tends to make teachers a bit prone to fadism, I think. I saw some of the Reigns schools getting very caught up with new programs that they swore would make the difference, but on track record they probably won't. Now some of this fadism, of course, might be also be purposeful fiddling while Rome burns. What you do when you need to make a plan, but conditions are such that you can't really do what you want to do, so principals' conferences at the moment, for example, the line-up of speakers is very de depoliticised, I think, often. 
it's clear from the programs that you are more likely to hear someone's inspirational life story than strong educational analyses. But appearances can be deceptive because there's a lot going on under the cover of all this motivational speaking. It's when teachers or principals get together collectively at conferences that, that, they're at, that they are at their most feisty, as recent ministers of education have found out in, in various ways. Of course, when it comes to resisting policy, many teachers will resist passively, and they're very good at that. Um, here's a photo of, a, of um, a poster of the National Standards, and it's kind of tucked in down behind the teacher's desk, um, you know, pushed in behind the, the guitar that just gets pulled out regularly. And I'm pretty confident that this teacher would say, well, I've got a poster of the National Standards up in my classroom, um, but in fact uh, it's not being um, uh, referred to uh, very much on a day-to-day -day basis, that's for sure. And in the RAINS reports, we see all kinds of ducking and diving and softening of impact of the National Standards. And sometimes we see more active resistance at Cicada, for example. Or we've, got, we've seen the BTAC schools, the Board Taking Action Coalition. And I admire all that. Um, very much, I have to say. I think, you know, we're, we're, in terms of contestation and policy, it's a great case study, uh, the way that New Zealand has responded uh, to the national standards. But Reins also shows there are limits to which schools will be able to resist policy and that they will often try to make a virtue um, out of necessity. Well, I'm going to um, draw things to a close and I want to um, end with a theme that I've often developed previously, for instance, in the clu uh, concluding chapter of this New Zealand-based book, which is all, uh, about to go into its fifth edition, and it's the importance of teachers raising their heads to take a critical view of the society and politics within which their work is situated. The problem is that if teachers only pull the cart, they leave themselves vulnerable to practices that may not be in the best interests of just themselves, but also the, the children and the families that, that they're dealing with. Taking a more critical view doesn't always make for an easier life for teachers. But I think one of the agenda items for this conference is to celebrate the critical thinking there is out in schools, despite the various constraints that I've raised, and think about ways to encourage more of it. Nō rara tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora tātou katoa.